Good Thursday morning. We're, we're still rolling along here in St. Mark's Gospel. Today is a, a sort of a briefer one, okay? Um, he's getting, he, I'll read it to you, okay? I don't want to mess it up. He said, uh, Jesus withdrew toward the sea with his disciples, and a large number of people followed from Galilee and from Judea. Hearing what he was doing, a large number of people came to him also from Jerusalem, from Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from the neighborhood of Tyre and Sidon. In a sense, the world is coming together to him, okay? The immediate world, but that's symbolic of the much larger world, okay? He told his disciples, this is the key line, okay? Think of the bark of Peter, okay? If this ain't the church, I give it up. Then I don't know how to read, okay? He told his disciples, have a boat ready for me, for him, because of the crowd, so they would... Because they uh, would not, uh, so that they wouldn't crush him. They were really coming at him. Think of the church coming together. And you're going to see tomorrow the institution of the apostles as the, as the head. You see, the calling of the apostles, the structure of the church. But right now he needs a boat. That's the church. You see? Because the people are coming together. They're coming together, you see? See, you see, so they would not crush him. He had cured many, and as a result, those who had diseases were pressing upon him to touch him. The world is coming together. He fractioned the outliers, the outsiders. See, the out, even the insiders. Remember, they're also coming from Jerusalem. The insiders and the outsiders. See, they're coming together, you see. Okay? They want to touch him. That's not magic. There's a great song. He touched me and nothing is the same. Remember, it's a love song. Barbara Streisand sang it. He touched me and nothing is the same. That's exactly right. When you touch somebody, it doesn't mean you bump into them in a bar or in a subway. It means when you touch them, you touch them. That's an intimate moment. Watch old folks. Watch anybody who loves another person. Watch how they touch each other. How, what a difference. They don't grab, they touch. There's a tenderness in the touch. It's a life-giving touch. It's a moment of intimacy. See? And these people who are estranged touch Jesus and in touching him come together. See, that's the life of the church. It should be anyway. It's a great analogy. I like that analogy of touching. I think of Barbara Streisand's song, He touched me, nothing is the same. What do you mean, bumped into me? I mean that touched me. Okay. Sometimes you are touched. Do you remember the expression we use? I was touched by what you said. You see? What does that mean? The words bounced off of me? What does it mean? I was moved by it in an intimacy of heart. Through the intimacy of love itself, I felt it in the touch. And the touch might be your words, a gesture, a word, a sign, a moment. An invitational moment. It could be silence. A quiet invitation through silence. Speak to me. Speak and touch my heart. Speak to me. Speak to my heart. Touch my heart. You see? That's what he's saying. It's a neat thing. It's a beautiful thing. You see? Okay? And he said he had cured many. And as a result, those who had diseases were pressing upon him to touch him. Now, when whenever unclean spirits saw him, they would... Uh, they would fall, da fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. They were also, in a sense, approaching him and terrified by the forces of evil, the forces of divisiveness. It takes courage to love. It takes great courage to touch another person and to allow yourself to be touched because it's a moment in which you become vulnerable to the beauty of love itself. It takes courage to be loved because it takes trust. You have to be willing to be swooned by the beauty. It's sometimes safer to protect yourself. That's sad, isn't it? You see that? I don't know if this is true or not, but a friend of mine told me one time that a psychiatrist who worked with abused children said the hardest part of his job, I think it was a man, I'm pretty sure, the hardest part of his job was to get an abused person, even as an adult, to ever trust again. They could do a lot of things, but it won't trust, see? Because trust allows for vulnerability. To trust another person, you allow them to touch you. People who have been hurt 
in loving relationships have been abandoned and been betrayed, very often will never trust again. They'll guard themselves in their relationship with us. You see in divorcees, not always, but you do see it. You see it, they will not trust another woman or another man again completely, so they guard themselves. And the problem with that and the sadness and tragedy of that is they don't open themselves up to love. They will sadly compound, compound, compound the rejection by making themselves isolated. It goes from bad to tragic, see, because their fear to touch and be touched. And I can understand it. I can understand it, but I also know it's fatal. You have to have the willingness to be touched and to touch. See? These people in the gospel wanted to touch Jesus, but that means in touching him, they are also vulnerable. Not, they're vulnerable not to horror. They're vulnerable to the challenge of life itself. They will never be the same again. See? Sometimes there is great safety in sitting in your own inner chamber of hate and anger because at least you know those emotions. You see that an awful lot. It takes courage to forgive. It takes great courage to reach beyond, to forgive in the sense, to give yourself, make yourself open again, to be touched and to touch. That's Christianity, but it's also good psychology. What do you think a therapist is doing when <laughs> working with an abused person? Trying to get them to trust again. Why? If not, they die. They die in their loneliness. The crime against them becomes fatal. You see that. Anybody in the racket that I'm in knows that. You see it. And then you see it when it doesn't happen. When, in fact, there is forgiveness in heart. I know a woman who, after 30 years of marriage, <clears throat> I don't want to get into it, but I know her very, very well. After 30-something years of marriage, her husband divorced her. As she said, he had a bevy of women he was, he was involved with. But she never stopped loving him. He's dead now. But she never stopped loving him, even though he hurt her badly. And I thought, my Lord, that's fidelity. That's love. That's love. Right? And she is whole because of that. She never stopped touching him. The way I knew she, he was dying is she was the one who told me. Years after they were divorced, she started crying. I said, what's the matter? She said, and she said his name, he's dying. See, what a powerful moment of love. See, that's the real thing. She still was in touch with her ex-husband because she had never, ever stopped being his wife. See, that's the wholeness that love will bring if you have the courage to love to touch and be touched. If not, you are gonna die alone. You may be safe, but you'll be safely alone. Maybe one day you wake up and realize you chose death over life, safety over the adventure of love itself. You were afraid to touch and afraid to be touched. That's the truth. It takes courage to love. It takes courage to love, to reach out and touch and even more to be touched.